What's up, guys? Welcome back. We are uh, here with another episode, and there is a lot of craziness going on uh, in the world right now, especially in the uh, in the world of the United States with the election. Um, just uh, <laughs> let's just say it's been uh, it's been interesting. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely some interesting things going on. Uh, we. we <laughs> We as Christians, I think in this episode, we're going to really dive into a little bit of the, you know, we as Christians need to be able to uh, put things in perspective. A lot of times it's difficult for people to put things in perspective because what, whatever is there in the moment is the, that that's it. That's all people can focus on. That's all they can think about the here and now. Uh, the scriptures teach us to to have a vision, to have... Uh, a focus that is different than than the world. Um, you, you know, Jesus said famously, you know, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. You know, the things you value, things you really place the ultimate value on. I mean, that's that's where your heart's going to be, and that's where your focus, that's where your attention, that's where that that's why he also said you can't serve God and money, or some translations say mammon. You know, the the. You, you really can't because what you focus on that is that is going that that's where you are that's that's who you are and it's ultimately going to determine your actions uh, your outcomes all that stuff so I think it's um I think it's important uh, not to uh, just talk ideals just talk scriptural ideals um, I, not talk about what's going on in the culture not talk about things that people are actually dealing with. I um I don't think that's necessarily um, a good way to, to approach it either, and so because of that, I think we should we should in balance uh, discuss things going on, talk about things that people are dealing with, but always put things in a scriptural light, and that's what we we try to do here um, with this uh, with this podcast. So uh, if you do have any questions, podcast at breadbreakers dot com podcast. At breadbreakers.com, we do try to take questions and answer them uh, scripturally. So any question is fair game, and we're going to use a scriptural uh, kind of litmus test, a scriptural barometer to to answer those questions as much as possible. Also, don't forget to like, um, share, subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, like the Facebook page, share this, get this out to people. I think a lot of times it's easier to share a video that somebody else made and say, hey, why don't you take a listen to this? Oops, let me turn that off. Um, hey, why don't you take a listen to to this as opposed to maybe engaging them in some kind of conversation or something? Maybe there's some friction. Maybe there's an issue there. Who knows? But um, again, we are in the middle of an election, a very, uh, a very critical election. And for Right now, on uh, for those on Team Trump, it's it's not looking great. The um, you know Biden's at, at at the time of this recording, he's at 264. Trump's at 214. Lots of red all over the place, but the blue is is slightly ahead. And um, it, honestly, we've done so much fasting and praying <clears throat> um, over the last month. Um, we've been on a chain fast over a month. Uh, just our church. And I know there's many, many churches fasting, praying, not just in America, but across the world. Um, I've been sleeping pretty well because what happens, happens. God is in control. Uh, we we uh, went and cast our votes. We did what um, we did what we can do within this human system that is set up. But at the end of the day, our hope is in the Lord, right? We need to set our affections um, not on the things of this world, and, and uh, it's it's hard to do. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it like um like that's some like super easy thing. Let me see if I can find that verse real quick. Um, you know, just to, it's Colossians three uh, and two. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your mind on things above. Things above, right? On heavenly things. Um, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then, of course, the, the famous 
um, scripture in, in Philippians, the toward the end of Philippians, Paul says, uh, finally, brothers and sisters, this is uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Okay, so so again, it's not a, it's not sticking our head in the sand. I mean, Paul said to rejoice with those that rejoice, and he said weep with those that weep. Um, Jesus often talked about the Christian life is going to be one with with suffering, tribulation, trials. It's not sticking our head in the sand, and being like everything's ha- everything's fine, everything's good, everything's good, good to go. Um, but at the same time, priority. We might be. We might be disenfranchised or disillusioned or or upset about a certain way that the you know the election's going, um, but we shouldn't put all of our hope and trust in systems of man. We should we should put our hope and trust in in God. Now, legitimately, right there, I, I think this is going to drag out. You know, who knows? Uh, I've said I've said I think like weeks. Um, because you have a lot of things that are at least look weird. Uh, let's take all that off the table for a minute and just think about one thing. And that is COVID, right? We've got people in homes. We've got people mail-in ballots to a, to a degree that we've never had before, completely unprecedented. Um, just that alone should give us pause and say, hey, we shouldn't we want to have even stronger controls around the election this time around um, just to make sure everything is good, everything's above board? Uh, people were screaming and crying and wailing for years about Russian interference, huge investigation, absolutely no evidence found. If you don't believe me, don't go look at the, you know, the, the um, alphabet soup of the media, right? CNN, Fox... NBC, you know, don't look, don't look there. Um, instead, go and find a copy of the actual report. Read through it. They they didn't find any evidence of Russian interference, right? But going into it, if we had known there was probably going to be Russian interference, shouldn't we put safeguards in against Russian interference? Well, yes, of course. Or Chinese interference, or any kind of interference. Which, um, you know, interestingly, how, you know, we don't we don't hear a whole lot about. Chinese interference, right? <laughs> um, anyway, I, you know, just so I, I think we should want with with none of the shenanigans happening. If none of the shenanigans happen at all, we should still want legitimately whatever side wins. We should want to make sure it's legit. And then, of course, we've got you know uh, reports of all kinds of shenanigans and of course it is it is again some of this stuff is strange i'm legitimately saying it is strange um it's it's odd that most of the shenanigans are going one direction right all most of the ballots that are found late in the night three o'clock in the morning when nobody is is awake seem to be leaning toward biden um it, 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 it is a little i mean again it is a little weird we had that video that came out of the uh of the um, U.S. Postal Service worker, um, it was dropped by um, what's the name? Project Ver- Veritas. I think it's O'Keefe is his name, but he does a lot of this like expose stuff. He'll go undercover, get videos of people, and he does video only, I believe, because he wants it to be less refutable. Um, which of course people still refute it, or Facebook, YouTube, whoever might just just take the video down, just take it all, down all the way, but. <clears throat> You know, at the end of the day, um, you know, this guy that works for the Postal Service, they got his, you know, face blocked out and his voice, um, you, you know, changed to probably protect his job or protect his, who knows, his job at the very least. But he said that, you know, in Michigan, his his leaders in his post office um, came, to, came to them and said, basically, hey, get out there, get as many ballots as you can, and this was day after the election um, and round them up, pile them up. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to hand stamp them yesterday's date. So, I mean, that is absolute fraud. Now, was that only 10 and it doesn't really matter? Biden still won. 
or was it, you know, I don't know. I, and that's and that's the thing. Every American should want an election that is open. It's in the light of day. We can audit it. It's easy to trace these votes to real people. Everybody knows that things happen where pets vote, people that are dead vote. Uh, there's a, po a poll worker saying that she was looking at some stuff on votes, and people were, like, born in 1921, which is already, wow, that's a, that's a real... It's a long time to live, but hey, congratulations, you're 100 years old, right? But they were born in 1921, I think it was, and they were, but they registered to vote in 1900. How did you register to vote 20 years before you were born, right? Stuff like that. And again, that could be, you know, a total of 10,000 votes across the entire country didn't move the needle at all. Um, that's fine, but I think we just should want a, a an open, fair election and whoever truly did win they are the winner um and and that we should rest and know that's god's will whoever won that's god's will he is going to uh be in control or he is in control and then on the other side we should also want peace now if people want to truly peace peacefully um, protest or these kinds of things fine but peacefully doesn't look like there's buildings on fire in the background uh, there's no such thing as a mostly peaceful protest if rocks are getting thrown, police officers are getting injured, um, stores are broken into, and you know TVs stolen. That's not, there's no such thing as mostly peaceful. It's either peaceful or it's not. And so I think we we should pray for peace. We should want peace, and we should want truth. And ultimately, God is in control. God is going to prevail. And this actually falls, this whole election thing fell right directly in the middle of our study of uh, 1 Peter. You can go check it out uh, last Wednesday. We had a watch party Wednesday at, at the church. What we do is the first Wednesday of the month, we push people to do church in homes like they did in, in the book of Acts and through the scriptures. And um, in order to help facilitate that, a couple of folks broadcast from the church. So we get people to get together, like 630, fellowship, pray, um, study the Word, and then at 7.30, they can tune in, and we can kind of interact and stuff online. And it's great. You have groups of, you know, 5 to 10 to 15 people throughout the county gathered together, in church, having church in their homes. It, it, it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Anyway, we are, we're studying the book of First Peter. You can go check it out on um, YouTube. We um, we have that out there. Also, Facebook, um, well, it was Facebook Live, but now you can go look at the archive on our Facebook page, but we're going through 1 Peter, and part of 1 Peter chapter 2, chapter 2 is what we did this last Wednesday, says this, 1 Peter 2, 13 uh, through 17, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorance talk the ignorant talk of foolish people live as free people but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil live as god's slaves show proper respect to everyone love the family of believers fear god honor the emperor now the emperor was by and large these were very evil very pagan idolatrous uh men and you know, often requiring people to to worship them as a god, and if not, you'd be punished sometimes with death. Um, now, now again, at the exact time of Peter's writing, um, I'm not sure who the emperor was at that time, but uh, there there wasn't a Roman emperor um, in this time that was uh, you know <laughs> saint. Justice the Noble or anything like that. These guys were were not great great people. And um, yet he says to submit to the, the human authority, submit to the emperor, right? Give honor to to them in their position. Uh, and I think a lot of Christians sometimes have a hard time doing that. They feel justified because of certain um, immoral things in a leader or, uh, certain policies maybe that leader pushes that are wrong, right? I mean, certain things, we, we did a whole podcast going into the into the election about how Christians, Christians, when they look at the murder of babies, 
that should be it. They should not need to, need to know a single other thing. This person's for it. This person's against it. Obviously, Christians cannot vote for people <laughs> who who want to murder babies, right? Um, well, they can, duh. But right, should we was was the real thing? Should we be voting for that? But that doesn't give us the right to um, to dishonor people, to hate people. Um, that attitude is completely wrong. It's completely out of line with 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 the Christian attitude okay the the Christian attitude is right here in first Peter we need to honor the king we fear God we are reverence our fear our ultimate allegiance is to God and we'll talk about that more as we unfold this uh, this episode here but but we do we need to honor the king and not just the king the ambassadors those who flow from um, from from their leadership now, we do know that in the in the book of Daniel, if you go, if you go to Daniel chapter two, um, verse twenty one, it, it says that God is the one. All right, he he changes times and season he seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. Right, God is the one in control. God is the one in control. That doesn't mean be lazy, just sit around, well, God's in control, what's going to happen is going to happen. Uh, I think in a country like ours, where we do have the opportunity, the ability to vote, for instance, I think if every Christian stayed home and said, oh, what happens, happens, it's in God's hands, who are the ones who are going to be voting? Right? If every Christian stays home, that means only non-Christians are going to determine the fate of the country. God does honor the system that is that is set up. And so we need to, um, I think, I think, I think, do our part. We should be informed voters. I don't think people who are completely uninformed should just go out there and vote because they are Republican or I'm a Democrat. I vote this way. Or, you know, somebody said one time that this blah, blah, blah. But if you, you do a little bit of research, it's not that difficult for Christians to figure out the, the correct scriptural choice. Um, then we get to uh, another scripture um, in in the in the Word of God, and again, some of these scriptures just really are like, whoa, um, <clears throat> honor the honor the emperor. Doesn't really matter, you know, if they've got bad policies, if they're a bad person. We we should that that position, uh, that person is there because God allowed it to happen, right? So God is in control, and we should honor uh, the governing authorities. Romans chapter thirteen verses one through seven really go into goes into this even more in depth. So we have Peter saying it in first in his uh, in his epistle, First Peter. Then we have in Romans we have Paul saying it. Romans thirteen one through seven. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. So he's reiterating what Daniel said. Uh, God is the one who allows. Now, why would he allow a pagan king? Why would he allow a bad ruler? Why would he? Well, it's obvious in the Old Testament he allowed people that were evil to rule, right? To either to punish the people of God, to to punish people, to um, to show a contrast between righteousness and unrighteousness. There's there's different reasons why God might allow this to happen, uh, but again, he he reiterates there is no authority except that which God established. So if Trump is the one who wins, that's because God wanted it to happen that way. Uh, if if Biden is the one uh, who wins, it's because God wanted it to happen that way. Nothing in the world happens without God's um, allowing it. Uh, and sometimes he allows things that he may not may not be his preference, but in order to uh, show his glory and maybe teach his people a lesson, uh, he will allow things to uh, to occur, right? We, we were going through in our Bible reading Ezekiel, I think it's chapter seventeen or eighteen, where it's where it actually says God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. He's not happy that that happens, but he will absolutely destroy the wicked, right? So uh, let's go on. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. If we if we stand against the authority that God has established, 
we uh, we we will bring judgment on ourselves. Now we're going to get into this more and talk about it, okay? Because you might be thinking, "Oh my goodness, what if the, a law comes out? You can't worship God, or you know, hold on, hold on, let's get there." But first, let's deal with the side of we are to honor and obey the laws of the land, the rulers that we have. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Now remember God's idea of good. He's the servant for your good. Well, if he needs the people of God, if he needs the world, if he needs people to learn a lesson, don't elect someone like this or this is what you get, right? You can't go back and say, well, that couldn't possibly be God's will. Yeah, he might be saying, this is for your good because I'm teaching you you need to not do this, right? <laughs> so again, we shouldn't think that good means God is just showering his blessings and he's just blowing kisses at us or whatever. Um, God looks at ultimate good, right? Old, like, like the guy in Corinthians where Paul said, boot this guy out of the church um, because of the sin and what he, what's going on. Uh, the immediate, I mean, this obviously that's embarrassing. This is a you know community, so there's 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 pain there, and there's family members left behind. So maybe there's a even a bit of a riff within the family. How could this possibly be good? Well, Paul says, for the destruction of the body, so that he maybe his soul can be saved. Right? Ultimately, it is for good if we boot this guy out of the church. One, it helps protect the church. One, it helps clean the church up, remove the leaven. Right, to use some scriptural language, remove the leaven so that the lump can be pure and holy and all that stuff. But even for the person, give him over to Satan. Oh my goodness, that can't possibly be good. For the destruction of the body, oh, that can't be good. No, that's not a good thing. So that his soul can be saved, right? So again, God looks at ultimate goodness. And sometimes it's it is ultimately good to have some bad situations happening, to have a, a bad ruler over you at the time. So um, we need to we need to under, we do need to understand that um, God is looking at ultimate good. So it goes on. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also a matter of conscience. So it's not just, uh, well, I can get away with it and not get punished. No, for conscience sake, a good conscience before God, we should, we should conduct ourselves in this manner. This is also why you pay taxes. Oh, come on, Paul. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So two apostles address this situation that, no, we, we are not you know, going to riot, and rebel, and have an uprising and be throwing rocks and stoning people and killing people and hurting people and this kind of thing. Now, we, we do have a system of government now that, that, that we are in in the United States where we, we are able to voice our opinion. We are able to get out there and have a platform. We are able to vote. We, we, we can so so this is this is great this is a great system because God honors the system that's in place okay so we need to we need to respect honor even pay taxes now was it Marshall who was who was the um, ah I forget anyway Supreme Court Justice, um, famously, his name is escaping me right now, uh, famously said that there's nothing wrong um, with conducting your affairs in order to minimize your tax burden, right, legally, the things you can legally do. So it's not saying, you know, you're, you're not paying, paying your fair share if you're somehow, like, legally not paying ta some taxes, right? <laughs> like, if, if, if the law allows you to pay $100, there's no reason to pay 500 um. So, again, Matthew twenty-two. Next scripture here. Oh, it just gets deeper and deeper here, folks. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him, Jesus, in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, 
we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites! Uh, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. So, show me the coin. Let me. Let, let, I'll, I'll give you an answer. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. So, you know, on one hand, you know, can we trap him in, in saying that, no, we, we, we don't have to worry about um, obeying uh, obeying Caesar, in which case they could then go to the authorities and say, hey, we heard him say this, we this is insurrection, kill Jesus for us. On the other hand, if he said, no, um, uh, no, you, you need to submit to Caesar, just just do do everything the authorities are telling you, then he would actually be... Um, putting Caesar in the place of God. And instead, he gives them, they, they offer him this false choice. Is it Caesar? Is it God? And he said, yes. <laughs> do we obey Caesar or do we obey God? And he said, yes. <laughs> give Caesar what's Caesar's and give God what's God's. Um, which is, the per again, the perfect answer uh, in this situation because um, it gets back to uh, what they were teaching in First Peter and Romans, and also in Titus 3 and 1, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. So all throughout the scriptures, we are, we are taught to honor and give respect and reverence and, and everything to the human authorities, the civic authorities that are in place and we are, we are told that those people are in place because God has deemed it so. Um, once again, there's been lots of prayer, lots of fasting and everything going into this election. And so, um, ah, it was learned hand. Justice, learned hand. Just, just came to me. I, I don't know. I think I was confusing him with Marshall Thurgood. Um, learned hand. Yeah. I mean, how do you forget a name like that? Wow. But anyway, that's just, uh, that's neither here nor there. That's my uh, my brain kicking in. Maybe the coffee, maybe I needed a little bit more coffee or something. I'm not sure. But anyway, learn in hand. But now we're going to switch gears here and, and get a little bit more into this idea of we aren't just citizens of this world. That's the thing is when people are so caught up and so distraught over who's in authority, who's in power, um, I think there's there's a little bit of that where, I mean, are are you really considering yourself a in, in the kingdom of God or is this world where you, really where you you're putting all your eggs in that basket? I will say this as a matter just as a matter of maybe a little bit of hope for those who are looking at the uh, <laughs> are, are looking at what's going on, um, and getting distraught, getting worried. One thing, a couple of things here. First of all, this obvious because it's so close, because it's so close, and because um, the, it, it, it's not that like a landslide victory in all this. It's clear that the American people do not want full-on, full-scale socialism, which is evil. I think I'm going to get the, into that into a different uh, a podcast in the future. It's not just like a bad idea economically. It's actually rooted and built in. It's grounded in. E evil concepts, um, which put which puts man in full control and man at the center and the focus. Um, but we, uh, we, there is some hope here, okay, because we as a country don't want that. That's very clear. That's why it's so, we're just razor, razor thin, right, is how close these margins are. Um, also, if you look at the Senate, right, because people were thinking that, that uh, if Biden wins, he's going to walk in, they're going to win the Senate, keep the House, 
That didn't happen. It looks, it's looking very much like the Republicans will uh, hold on to the Senate. Um, they've actually, I believe, gained seats in the House. Um, yeah, they've gained, what, six seats in the House at this point in time. Um, they've, uh, they've gained a seat, um, or no, they, they, they lost one seat in the, in the Senate, but they look like they are going to hold on to their majority. So again, this is, this is one of those things where the balance of power, hopefully if it is Biden, it doesn't shift completely over to, um, to a, a full, Democratic run government, but rather we have that that balance of power that the that the founders of the country actually kind of wanted, right? So maybe we end up with a uh, maybe it's a maybe it's a Democratic president, Democratic House, and a Republican Senate, or maybe we we end up Trump wins and we end up with a Republican House and re, or I'm really messing up here, Republican Senate and Republican president, but then a Democratic House, right? Again, balance of power is not fully one way or the other, so. Uh, again, that should give people some hope. That should give people some hope that probably, um, you know, the Repub- Republicans are going to have the Senate no matter which way the presidential election goes. Uh, we Supreme Court, right? We've got good news on the Supreme Court with uh, uh, Justice Barrett now, you know, fully confirmed. So, so again, there's there's good news, but but the the, the good news, the the better news, right, is that really no matter how it goes. We go full socialism with a with a totalitarian dictator. Um, God's in control, and we are part of a kingdom that is not of this earth. John eighteen thirty six. Jesus said, "My kingdom is not as the, of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place." Jesus says, "Yeah, my my there would be violence. There would be fighting. There'd be rioting." There'd be, um, you know, insurrection if if my kingdom were of this world. But my followers are not doing that. We are not people who do that. Why? Because his kingdom is not of this world. John 3, 1 through 5. There was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him, Jesus replied, Verily, verily, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Right? You can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. So he, it, it, is, a, it is a spiritual entrance it's a new birth experience, a birthing into. We become citizens of a higher kingdom. We are born of water and spirit into that kingdom. Colossians 1.13, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is, again, there is a dominion of darkness. This world ultimately is, is, is dark, um, the Bible talks about, you know, Satan being the prince and power of the air, and you know, kind of the prince over this world. The, human systems are are not going to be um, anything but really evil, um, unless it's a system that puts God in the forefront, puts God first. Uh, God needs to be in a governmental system, otherwise that system will be fully just man, which is fully the devil, okay? Because man man is going to serve one of those two masters, either God or Satan. And, and again, when man is serving himself, he is not on team God. He's not on team Jesus, which puts him by default on team Satan. So we are not of this kingdom. We are in the kingdom of the Son, Jesus Christ, right? We have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins through him. Um, but remember, these, these scriptures are not just telling us, oh, one day when we die, we get to go to heaven. I'm all about that. That's fantastic. I can't wait. 
but it's so much more than that. And I think, again, you can develop an earthly mindset, but still feel like, oh, yay, but one day when I die, I can be saved and not, not have the peace that comes with knowing. It doesn't matter what happens with the systems of this world. Christ is in control. Jesus Christ has full authority, and I'm a member of his kingdom. That's what should matter. 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. We're foreigners, right? Some, some versions of the Bible say like things like strangers or pilgrims. We, that's what we are in this earth. Why? Because we are part of a different kingdom. Philippians 3 18 through 20. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Notice, people whose minds are just set on earthly things Let's read it again. Their destiny is destruction. They are enemies of the cross. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. We need to understand that, right? Their mind is on earthly things. When we we are just earthly, we are just, you know, other places in the Bible that say things like carnal or, you know, it's just secular. We're just, we're not godly. This is the way that we go. Here, here's the contrast, though. He says, but our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all right. We're citizens of heaven. We, yeah, we're not there in glory now, but we are already citizens of that place. We are already citizens in the kingdom of God. That is the thing that I think people need to need to focus on. It's We are already in the kingdom and we have an ultimate hope of Christ's return, ultimate glory, um, you know, at the, at some point in the future. First Corinthians fifteen seventeen to nineteen says, "And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile; you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied." Putting it in perspective. It's not just all earthly things. It's not just here. It's not, you know, my, my life is wrapped up in who's going to be the president. That is really, uh, that's not a good place to be at all, especially if you are claiming to be a Christian who is a member of the kingdom of God, a resident of heavenly, heavenly addresses, right? We, we have a heavenly address. We have a, we have a heavenly residence, um, now, okay, we are part of that kingdom right now, and when Christ comes and we're we're fully glorified and all is rolled up and said and done, okay, then we will continue. But right now, we are part of Christ's kingdom, which is a kind of a kingdom within a kingdom, right? We we've, we've got the or or maybe it's maybe that's not the right way to look at it. The kingdom of God is the is the grand kingdom that we need to be looking at and. And, and, and really seeing, because that's the ultimate. But then within that kingdom, there are kingdoms of man. There are governmental structures of man. And we do need to respect those and honor those and all that. But the greater thing is the kingdom of God. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So where, where does our all need to be? Where does our reverence need to be? It, it, it needs to be God his kingdom, that's our focus. Now, what are some good uh, some good uh, points to remember, some things to consider as we as we go about our lives with this dual kingdom mentality? I mean we're we're citizens of Christ's kingdom that if we're born again, that we are born into that kingdom. And if you're not born again, Get on board, right? Get, get on Team Jesus. You know, go down in the waters of baptism. Be filled with the Spirit. Christ will redeem you. Christ wants you to be part of His family, part of His kingdom. Um, and uh, as an ambassador of Christ, I, I would uh, I would say, what you waiting for? Come on over. Uh, the the the, the water is fine. The family of uh, of Christ and the believers, we um, we anxiously 
await uh, your redemption in Jesus' name. So, how can we how can we live? What are some things we should do? Well, First Peter or First Timothy rather, chapter two, verses one through four, give us a little bit of uh, a little bit of insight here. I urge then, first of all, so first things first, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceable and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. And pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So here we have the uh, the idea of we need to be in prayer, in intercession, right? We we should not just sit back casually, just eh. God's in control. What happens, happens. That is not the attitude we should have. We should we should be in active prayer, petition, thanksgiving, intercession. We should be praying for our kings, uh, our rulers, our authorities, all right? Presidents, prime ministers, members of, of parliament or congress or whatever it is, we should be in prayer for them, right? Why? So that we can, li- we can live peaceable, quiet lives and godliness and holiness. Because there are worldly systems that will come in and try and take that away from people. They don't, you, you, you disagree with them. They're not okay with you just agreeing to disagree. They, they want to actively stop people from serving Christ, uh, stop people from proclaiming the gospel, from teaching the principles of the kingdom, because the principles of the kingdom of God fly in the face of the kingdom of Satan, because there's only two kingdoms. And um, ultimately, there's a lot of people, a lot of governmental systems, a lot of things that will try to rip that from us and stop us and persecute us. And he's saying, let's pray. Let's be in prayer and intercession. And again, I, I, I repeat myself, right? Uh, we've been praying, fasting, all of this uh, for this election, and that's why uh, we just need to now realize it's in God's hands. He is in control. Let's step back. Let's continue to pray. Um, but let's um, let's believe and trust in God. But l- prayer I- is a massive thing that we should be doing for 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 the kingdoms of man. We should be praying. We should be praying for leaders. Praying for godly leaders. Praying for ungodly leaders. Not that ungodly leaders will get in, but that Lord God touch them, help them win them, or help you know help us to have peaceful lives even in an ungodly regime, whatever it might be. And in a country like ours, where leadership can be can be voted in and out, we should pray that God, we want godly people in in there, okay? Um, I don't need a, a, a straight angel from heaven to be the president, um, but I do want godly uh, laws. I do want godly agendas. I do want a godly platform. And uh, again, I think there's some very clear distinctions uh, between, at least right now, there are very clear distinctions in, in the platforms and policies that these, um, these people are pushing, right? When one group is pushing a, a genocide of, of the unborn and the other is not, that's a very clear distinction. So uh, that's an easy one to, to wrap our brains around. Uh, and really an easy choice for Christians. See, that's the thing. I, I like to go to the easiest, and then we can work our way to, you know, f- maybe slightly more difficult after that. Let's get the easiest off the table first, though, right? Second Kings 5, uh, 1 through 3. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. Um, he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but... He had leprosy. Now, bands of, get this, raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel. So a band of raiders goes out, possibly kills her family, you know, loots, right, plunders, gets this girl, snatches her up, brings her back to a foreign land, right, and she served, the Bible says, and she served Naaman's wife. That is a horrible situation. But look what verse 3 says. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. 
the, the mighty, incredible, I mean, there's Sunday school stories, there's, you know, messages preached, there's books, you know, with, with, with uh, commentary on the notable miracle of Naaman. But it was brought about because of a girl who didn't have her eyes on just the kingdoms of man. She didn't wallow in the fact, I can't, I, I mean, I don't even, I don't know, man. I certainly pray that I'd be able to have this attitude. I've been, you know, imagine this. You've been, you've been uh, taken captive by a band of looters, um, a raiders that have come in, you know, killed your friends, burned your house down, taken you to a foreign land. Now you're a slave to some dude's wife. <laughs> and you find out that the guy has leprosy and your heart is, hey, there's a guy that I know that can get you healed. You should you should go to him. Um, I pray that I could have that kind of attitude. But, but look what it is. It's a light, a light, an ambassador for the kingdom of God, even in a bad situation in the kingdoms of man. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now we see this being a light to those around us, even in bad circumstances. You know, again, I talked about this when we, um, in the last podcast before the election, when we're trying to be a light, let's say, in the realm of abortion, right? We should we should speak truth, but we should also be love and, and, and be gentle with people that maybe they've had an abortion, okay? Maybe they've, they've worked at an abortion clinic. They were actually part of the killing of babies. Um, this... This is a horrible situation, but but we can be a light. We can show love. We can Jesus can will will forgive you. Jesus can have mercy on you. Jesus can heal you of those those psychological, maybe even physical wounds and 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 pain that you're suffering because of this. Um, this is the message of the church for those. Um, now, yes, the system, the the ideology, the um, the policies, we should absolutely be against those vehemently. We are against the, mur- the murdering of the unborn. We are against murdering babies. We are against it. But, but we are for people who are created in the image of God. We want them to be healed and be redeemed and come to Jesus Christ. This is being a light, not compromising with the darkness, but being a light in love. I think that's, you know, speaking the truth in love is, is always a delicate balance, but it's something the church must do. So we see this 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 also with, like, say, Ezekiel, Daniel, right? They were taken off to foreign lands, um, they and yet they they prophesy, they, they heard from God, they didn't say, you know what, forget it, I'm done, I'm just going to wallow in my... No, they understood we are part of a greater thing. We are, we are part of a greater system, a greater kingdom. When we look at Daniel 3, though, And here's where um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about when there's a conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of man. Daniel 3, 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I always say Abednego. It's just from Sunday school, right? But it's Abednego. Abednego, right? But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just just because I can, replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing fire, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, they're firm, but, you know, they're saying, hey, your majesty, majesty, look, we're giving you some honor for your position. But they are telling him, up until this point, there's, we, we've been able to obey the laws and the, and the edicts of Babylon and also be in line with the laws and the edicts of the kingdom of God. But at this point, you are separating and we cannot obey the kingdom of man. And what must they do? They must obey God. Now, they knew, though, but that is going to cause... There will be repercussions. They weren't like, yeah, and and 
and and there should be no repercussion either. No, they were fully aware we're going to get thrown in this fire. And then they said, and even from there, there's two options. God could deliver us, and we believe he will, but even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down. That's the real, that really is the attitude that we must have when we develop this mindset of the kingdom, that when, we, when, the, when, when they line up, when the, kingdom, when the laws of the kingdom of, of man line up with God's laws and we can, we can obey them and not be violating kingdom principles, then, then we should do that. We should, you know, there's, there's nothing in the kingdom of God that says you, you can't pay taxes to a government that you don't agree with, right? Um, but if that government then, like they did with Daniel, Right, that government then says, "Oh, you can only the only the only deity that you can worship is the king." At that point, well, sorry, got to obey God. Now, what happened? Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. Right, they got thrown in the fiery furnace. Uh, sometimes God can rescue, but a lot of times he 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 may not. And so, we have to be ready to receive those repercussions. But ultimately, we must obey God. This is the same attitude that they had in the Book of Acts, Acts five. 29 Peter and the apostles reply we must obey God rather than human beings you know they were like listen we you know we have to obey God we can't we can't part with the kingdom of God to to obey the kingdom of man and then the example in Acts chapter 12 verses 1 through 5 shows you the repercussions it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church so he arrested people right intending to persecute them it wasn't just Peter he arrested people. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Okay, When he saw this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. So for political gain, for political reasons, a, a, an evil pagan man okay, a, persecutes the church. An evil pagan man, for political gain, political reasons, persecutes the church. Now, this happens today, even in America. There are things that happen, there are things that happen that, for political reasons, for political expediency, to gain votes or whatever it is, people who are politicians will go along with, even if they don't necessarily believe it themselves, they will still go along with evil ideologies, bad policies, uh, even persecution of the church because of political reasons. Look what happened. Proceeded to seize Peter. Also, this happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to uh, be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So we see again a picture of that. The church is praying. The church is seeking the face of God. The church is, is doing what Paul talked about in First Timothy, right? We're praying. We're doing we're, we're interceding. We are living our lives. We're trying to be peaceable and quiet and go about in godliness and all this stuff. And here Herod persecutes the church for political gain. Uh, of course, we know this. Oh, yeah, and then Peter was let out of prison. But what about the other people who were thrown into prison? doesn't say they were let out, too. <laughs> what about James? He died. He was, he was executed. Now, we know um, from, from at least historically um, church history, uh, Peter was martyred. Most of the apostles were martyred. So w there are martyrs today, okay? There are martyrs today. There are people in the, in, in the world uh, of communism, for instance, which we'll talk about when we talk about uh, socialism, because really socialism is communism, uh, or I should say communism is socialism, um, just uh, just met out all the way. To the end, it, it becomes total and utter communism, but, you know, we'll, we'll get there. We'll, <laughs> but I digress. Um, uh, so there's communist regimes. There are um, socialist re regimes that are very materialistic and very um, secular, and they persecute the church. Maybe not to the same degree. Maybe not necessarily throwing somebody in prison just for the for the faith that they have. But they will have other means, like you know, well, you, we want this to be taught to your kids, or we want this to happen. And your Christian beliefs say, no, I can't do that. And the government says, well, you're supposed to do it. We're going to come take your kids, or we're going to throw you in jail. We're going to. Th this does happen all over the world right now, today. 
Um, people are killed for their faith in the Middle East. I mean, this, this is all throughout the world. Kingdoms within the kingdom. Finally, Acts 4.29. Acts 4.29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. This is the attitude of the church. We should be in prayer. We should pray for our our, our, our governments and our, our kings and our presidents and our uh, we should we should absolutely pray. We should seek God. We should intercede. Um, but we ultimately our residency, our citizenship is that of heaven. We are the kingdom of God. And so what happens here does have an effect on our lives. And personally, I would I would prefer a a system that is friendly toward Christianity. Even though that does have its, uh, it, it's it, that has its pros and cons, but I would, pre- I think I'd prefer that, um, personally, selfishly, right? But we do have to be careful. We we must obey the laws of the land as long as they don't contradict, go against the principles of the kingdom. Once that happens, once the roads diverge like that, we must follow God. But remember, that does mean there there could be consequences. Maybe evil consequences, maybe bad consequences that shouldn't happen, that God is upset with, but those consequences might happen. We need to understand that. But our attitude needs to be, our attitude needs to be, we will, we will follow God rather than man. And ultimately, God, there are we are under persecution. There's threats. There's these things happening. But what do they pray for? Boldness to speak God's word. They didn't even pray for God stop the persecution. Ultimately, what was their what was their aim? What was their, what were they thinking? They were not thinking this world. They were not thinking earthly. They weren't thinking temporary. They were thinking kingdom. And what is God's desire in the kingdom? That other people be born into it. That we make disciples. That we reach out. That we be a light. And so they said, knowing that we're going to get persecuted for this, knowing that there's threats, knowing that they're going to throw us in jail, beat us, kill us, God, give us boldness to speak Your word. So ultimately, it doesn't matter who wins this election. We are God's kingdom. He's in control. We are God's kingdom. And we must be focused on His kingdom, His purpose, His business. We are the children of God. We are citizens of heaven. We are members of God's kingdom. 